fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to episode 182 of the Falcoholic Live. I'm your host, Kevin Knight, joined by my special guest this evening, Aaron Freeman at Falc Fans, host of the illustrious Locked on Falcons podcast. Aaron, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing all right, Kevin. I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to tonight's show. Yeah, you know, there's there's been a lot of, uh, we'll say, you know, tumultuous uh goings on over the past really? week for falcons yeah i thought it was a pretty quiet off season so far so definitely you know, yeah <laughs> i guess i guess you'll have to enlighten me on, on some of the stuff that's been happening yeah you know there was a certain quarterback that left a certain quarterback came in a certain quarterback seemed like he was gonna come but then he didn't you know so there's been <laughs> there's been a lot so of moves good. and that's just quarterback you know there's been other stuff too but uh yeah guys we uh obviously if you missed our matt ryan discussion We did break that down in detail on Monday night show. Um, So we won't dive too much into that more into what the team should do now. Mostly free agency talk. And then around 8.50, 9 o'clock, we will have legendary Falcons Pro Bowl fullback Patrick DeMarco joining us alongside Evan Birchfield at some point as well. So you guys have that to look forward to. 8.50, 9 o'clock, something like that. Pat will be here. So uh, we got some detailed stuff to talk about and then a great inter well speaking of evan birchfield right now there we go i didn't even get out there evan how you doing man hey welcome welcome yeah we decided to start without you i'm sorry that is okay <laughs> i knew you wouldn't be that offended but i like to show up like fashionably late but like not really that late just a few minutes so yeah i was just about to transition out of the intro so you came honestly at just the right time so how are you doing oh, okay tonight? i'm good no complaints for me. Good. Other than the state of the team in general, no complaints. Yeah. Uh, this is the always, forum for uh, that. This is the forum yeah. for that. Anyway, the airing of grievances. So, yes. um, yeah. Well, let's let's jump right into it. Obviously, um, those of us here at the Falcoholic got a lot of opportunity to talk about Matt Ryan. Aaron, if there was anything that you wanted to add on here about Matt Ryan that you haven't been able to cover adequately on your show or that you just wanted to make sure you got off your chest. I was going to let you have an opportunity to, to say that before we dive into other topics, but uh, well, we've, look, we've I, sort I've of talked about to death. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been griping nonstop on Lockdown Falcons the last couple of days, so I'll, I'll keep my gripes short. Um, <laughs> I was not upset that the Falcons ultimately traded Matt Ryan. I was basically upset that they got so little back for him that when you basically compare it to pretty much any other quarterback trade that has happened in the last yes. couple of years, yeah. that yeah. the Falcons got the least possible. They got less than Sam Darnold. They yep. got less than what Carson Wentz twice that Carson Wentz got traded. Yep. You know, and of course, let alone, you know, the, the Matt Stafford's and the Russell Wilson's and all that various things. So that was really my frustration. And, um, you know, I get for a lot of fans, you know, from a results versus process standpoint, uh, you look at the results and you say the Falcons are finally ripping off the Band-Aid. They're now doing the rebuild that so many fans have been pushing for over the last year. Uh, so it doesn't matter that maybe they had a flawed process uh, to get to that result, uh, which I get. Again, you know, fans are going to be fans. I don't mean this in a condescending way, but maybe you know, a little bit. Yeah. Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you and Evan experienced this, you know, quite often when you guys uh, do your various post game shows or whatever. If the Falcons win, everything's good, and there's not a single thing that happened in that game that went wrong. And when they lose, there's not a single thing that goes right. It's a similar process, and so I get it from that standpoint of any criticism in in the fans of, of, of those fans' eyes when it comes to this was the right result. Who cares about the process? I get that from that perspective, but for me, it does raise some concerns about um, the overall direction of the team. Uh, given basically seemingly over the last three weeks, they had like three different plans yeah. <laughs> that they have tried yeah. to enact. Uh, and it just kind of tells you that they're kind of making up as it goes along, which is not unheard of in the NFL, but you just kind of hope that they will do a better job moving forward of, of sort of landing on their feet and, and, you know, getting more when they sort of make these spur of the moment decisions uh, than they ultimately were able to get in that Matt Ryan uh, trait. Yeah, I mean, the only, we talked about it before it happened, you know, the possibility of a Matt Ryan trade. The, the like, 1% to 2% thing is going to be, like, a running joke between us now, I think, as a result. So you'll, I'm going to I'm gonna enjoy that. Yeah, but, me, uh, that <laughs> I'm going to enjoy that. But, you know, all in good fun. But, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's things that you could do that for me, you know, as well. So it's, it's a tip for tat sort of thing, uh, quid pro quo. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, other than the compensation, everything about the trade was fun. Like... 
obviously you would have liked it to happen under better circumstances without the cloud of cloud of Watson hanging over it and everything. But Ryan going to the Colts, love it. I think that's a great fit for him. It doesn't really impact the Falcons. You know, it's out of the conference, out of the division. I don't think, I mean, the Falcons do play the Colts this year, I believe, but, or maybe it's 2023, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a good situation for Ryan. And I guess if you spin it how they tried to spin it, which was like we were trying to do Ryan like a solid. So we sent him to the Colts and, you know, damn the trade compensation. You know, like, I don't know if I fully believe that. <laughs> like, I think they were trying to do him solid. But I think if someone had come with like a first round pick, they probably would have taken the first round pick and been like, I'm sorry, Ryan. You know, you have to go play for the Jets or something. Um, but I don't think the offers were coming for whatever reason. Um so I, I, if you want to be upset at the trade, be upset at the trade compensation. But I think they did the right thing ultimately. Um, you know, I'm very disappointed in just the third round pick. I mean, that makes the rebuild a lot harder. Uh, it does help financially because now they can sort of bite the bullet on the cap this year, which is kind of what Fontenot talked about today, at today's press conference with regards to that. Um, so they'll be out of these these contracts for the most part by next year, but cap space alone isn't going to do you anything like you have to be a desirable spot for these players you know not every player is going to take primo money to come to a bad team you know the jaguars have trouble getting free agents even though they have gobs of money every year so um it's not as simple as just saying like oh well we have 130 million in cap space we're gonna be able to sign anyone we want it's like technically you could sign anyone you want but are they going to want to come here that's still half the equation so we've got a long way to go uh, to turning that cap space into an actually good roster, but they'll have the flexibility to do things uh, if if they could get them done. So that is nice, um, and it is nice to have the extra ammunition, even though it's pretty bad. Uh, you know, pretty bad overall competition. It's nice to have the extra third round pick. It's definitely nice for my mock drafts. I love those extra day two picks. This is a good class to have it. You know, to be there, fair, there for a but, minute it kind of sucked because it's like. I seen how much time you put into mock drafts and stuff <laughs> like, you know, over the last few months. And it's like, Oh no, that may just be a waste of time. No, nah, no. Nah. Yeah. So no, nah, that, that's the thing. Yeah, no, it's actually great. Cause I was, you know, it, it you can only mock. That's why I switch between trades and no trades. Cause it's like, you know, th- there's only so many permutations of a draft you can have. So if I do it every two weeks now, there's an extra third round pick in the picture. So the possibilities are endless. Now I can coast all the way to the end of April. We're all, we're all good now. So, um, so that actually did me a solid, you know, I was hoping it would be the Ridley trade that would really shake it up and we'd have an extra first, but you know, I guess beggars can't be choosers. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, Let's move on, uh, unless there's anything you wanted to add on that topic, Evan, before we moved on. I'm good. Okay. Um, yeah, so free Asian additions. Obviously, there's one that has ignited excitement, and the fan base has gotten people really fired up, and it was not the court- the quarterback who's going to be the Falcons star this year. It was Corderell Patterson's back, baby. Uh, so, obviously, that's a big signing. It's pretty reasonable. I think it's like five point two five million per year over the next two years, which is less than I thought he'd end up signing for. I thought it would be at least six. Um, so it's it's great to have Patterson back. He gives them a reliable running back and someone who could help as a receiver. Uh, it sort of helps them in both spots. It it gives the team at least some kind of dynamic presence out there. So it's a good place to start. Aaron, how do you feel about the Patterson re-signing and the price that they paid to bring him back? It's a, it's a, about where I kind of was hoping they would get him. I was hoping for something like a two year, like nine million dollar contract. Uh, it's probably in that nine ten million dollar range. So getting him at ten and a half uh, is just right above that uh, and below sort of where my kind of break point was, which was that two years twelve plus million, where I'd be like, I don't know about you know all of this. And ultimately, I think the Falcons structured it in in a good way, where it's it's kind of a one year contract, and then we'll see. So if if Patterson does suffer regression, uh, the Falcons won't be hamstrung, uh, you know, in in addition to all the other cap space that they have in 2023, they'll be able to create uh, some more pretty easily, but certainly is a good, healthy uh, raise for Cordero Patterson for, you know, a really banner year and a breakout year for, for Atlanta and certainly will add some much needed explosiveness 
back into the Falcons offense as we sort of look for who is going to make plays other than Kyle Pitts on offense uh, this upcoming season. So uh, particularly with the loss of Russell Gage and and whatnot, I think it was really critical for the Falcons to to at least get uh, Cordero Patterson back. So I think it's a good move on that part. Yeah, yeah, totally agree there. Evan, your thoughts on the return of Cordero Patterson? I mean, I think it's one of the few wins the Falcons had this offseason. Um, just from a marketing standpoint, I mean, getting rid of Matt Ryan, all of a sudden the, the business side, they need to market somebody. And Cordero Patterson's like perfect for that. Um, he's somebody who made it very you know, public that he wanted to be back in Atlanta. I mean, I, I haven't really seen a player – be that public about wanting to stay with this team uh probably ever just i mean it seemed like anytime he was tweeting something it was about like little hints that wanting to come back to the falcons um yeah, pff yeah. had him as like uh he was a top five running back according to pff i think he was second but i can't remember off the top of my head um and as aaron said you know it wasn't a terrible deal or anything um this offense you know is extremely limited um even more so than last year. So having somebody like Patterson, assuming he can kind of run it back um, is a good thing. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. It, it gives the team some much needed stability there. It, it also gives them some semblance of a starting running back. Um, so they don't necessarily have to go after a premium starter early, you know, between Patterson, Damian Williams and Mike Davis, who's still on the roster. I don't know if he will be forever, uh, but Mike Davis is still on the roster too. So that three running back group of Patterson, Damian Williams, and Mike Davis, I mean, that, that seems like that's fine. You know, if that's, if those are your three running backs, that's fine. It's not like a scary running back group, but it's mostly fine. So you add a rookie to that on day three, which is where I think they're going to end up taking a running back because this class is so freaking deep. You can get good running backs into the fifth, sixth round easily. Um, you know, so I think you add uh, a rookie like that in there and, I think it, it it's the it's the makings of what could be a, a pretty good group, and they'll need a strong running game now with the passing game likely to take a step back without Matt Ryan. And speaking of the passing game, we got a new sheriff in town, new quarterback. Uh, Marcus Mariota has signed with the Falcons. I believe his deal is like nine point seven five million per year or something like that. But um, most of it is next year, and it's apparently you know fairly easy to get out of. Like next year, sort of an option year. So they're really not paying Mariota very much. He does get a chance to start, which is good for him. And to be honest, you know, I think they could do a lot worse than Mariota as their starter. He's at least like somewhat intriguing. Uh, Maybe he has like some small sliver of hope that he could maybe turn into something more than just a backup. But um, it's obviously not a high chance. Uh, And, you know, he's probably going to be a below average starter more than likely. But Aaron, what are your thoughts on Marcus Mariota? Do you think he'll be the Falcons week one starter? Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm pretty confident he will be the week one starter. Um, I, I like this move a lot. I think as far as the perspective of the drop off from Matt Ryan to whoever would be that sort of new bridge. Uh, I think this is about as good a move the Falcons could have possibly made uh, and, and got him at a really good price point. I think they're paying him like half as much money as what the Saints are, are paying for yeah, James yeah. Winston. Um, and so you're looking at a situation where I, I think Marcus Mariota you know, as you sort of alluded to, Kevin, you know, I, I think he's a good player. I, I went back and watched his 2020 performance in, with the Raiders, where he kind of came in on a Thursday night game against the Chargers mm-hmm. uh, for an injured uh, Derek Carr and, and played really well in that game um, and, and showed a really strong connection with Darren Waller in that game. And sort of you have these visions yeah, of like him yeah. and Kyle Pitts hooking up quite a bit this year. Uh, so in a world where Marcus Mariota is the sort of Falcon starter for an extended period of time, I think, you know, I'm sure Evan will be writing about this once, once the season starts, but uh, Kyle Pitts will be a, a great sort of fantasy play uh, because, you know, Mariota is probably going to feed him a lot because who else <laughs> throw the ball to <laughs> at this point in time. But, yep. um, you know, I, I think my main concern with Marcus Mariota, as much as I like him and as much as I think he could be actually a pretty good starter and a pretty good reclamation pro- project theoretically Obviously, I don't think the circumstances that he's finding himself in Atlanta is conducive to that unless the Falcons absolutely just nail this upcoming draft uh, yeah. and and really make significant upgrades uh, to their roster across their offensive uh, position groups, you know, at the skill positions 
and as well at the, along the offensive line. Um, and that's what is the only thing that is the downside of this move is because it feels like when we look at the history, particularly in recent years, of non-playoff teams that have these sort of bridge quarterbacks like a Marcus Mariota, like those guys wind up not seeing the field because those teams wind up drafting t- uh, quarterbacks. And ultimately, once those teams are sort of eliminated from the postseason, they just say, well, you might as well give the young guy all these reps because we're not going anywhere with Marcus Mariota. And again, that's not, to me, a, an indicator that Marcus Mariota is incapable of taking the Falcons, though, where it's just the circumstances. And you look at that with Justin Fields and Davis Mills last year. You go the previous year with Justin Herbert. I know some of that's owed to you know Tyrod Taylor suffering multiple injuries. Uh, you know, the previous year with Daniel Jones sitting behind Eli Manning or however long that was. And, you know, the, the list goes on and on. So if the Falcons do wind up drafting a quarterback, which I think is likely at this point in time, but we'll see. Again, I also said it was very unlikely <laughs> that they would trade Matt Ryan. So uh, you can well, take you know. all my opinions with a grain of salt. <laughs> but uh, yes, yes. Let, let's say it's a greater than 2% chance that they take, <laughs> okay, take a quarterback. Great. Yeah, um, yeah. 2.83%. So okay, to, yeah, to yeah. Had, it, had uh, to sneak that in, yeah. But yeah, I think if if that's the case, then, you know, ultimately, you know, probably by the time we get to Halloween, you know, Marcus Mariota will be on the bench. And it's probably not, again, due to him being a poor player or a poor quarterback. Uh, it's just due to the, the potential circumstances that the Falcons probably will wind up finding themselves in the season. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and like, I don't know, sort of uh, Arthur Smith sort of has a little bit of a reputation as like a QB reclaimer. He did something, you know, what ended up Marcus Mariota getting kicked out of Tennessee, actually. Ryan Tannehill came in and as sort of a reclamation project, and Arthur Smith was like, hey, you know what? This guy's actually good. Why don't you be our starter, Ryan Tannehill? And then Ryan Tannehill became his starter. Uh, and the rest is history. You know, that now he's the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. So it is kind of interesting that he benched Mariota for Tannehill, and then his first guy he went back to was Mariota, which sort of implies that maybe it was more that, like, Mariota's struggling. Tannehill's actually looking really, really good. So we're going to play Tannehill more than just like, oh, I think he thought Mariota was bad or something. Didn't like him. But clearly he likes him if he went out and got him. I mean, he hasn't actually gone back and signed that many of his players from Tennessee here in Atlanta. One one thing I wonder is, is it possible, unless there's like a public statement that I totally missed or something, that Vrabel kind of pushed him to go with Tannehill? Maybe. Instead of like, so that maybe it's not... I mean, the easy connection is, you know, Arthur Smith Smith uh, benched him, but like it's perhaps possible. Maybe Vrabel did. He yeah. kind of got leaned yeah. on a little it's bit. Possible. I would imagine the head coach is making yeah. that call over the Probably. Right. right. Yeah. Which yeah. means it's possible Arthur Smith, you know, was a good offensive coordinator and listened to the head coach, but maybe he saw something in Mariota that, you know, not saying he's going to be a franchise guy, like Aaron said, he could right. be easily benched, if, especially if they draft a quarterback. Um, early and the team struggling and they want to see what the, you know, Willis or whoever they end up getting um, can do. But uh, yeah, I just, I, I wonder like how much, you know, cause you, if you're going to sign a guy literally the day you train Matt Ryan, to me, that tells you like, okay, this is more than likely opening day uh, starter and the coach probably had their eye on him, you know, before. So. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, I, I don't think that Arthur Smith would... It, it's, like, interesting because he has recent experience with Mariota. The only other team that does is the Raiders. And they, you know, obviously they have Derek Carr, so they weren't going to keep Mariota from signing as a starter somewhere to keep him as their backup. They weren't going to pay him anywhere close to this much. So, um, you know, good for Mariota getting this chance. I, I like, agree that... Of the guys that were out there, I mean, I think Marietta might be the most intriguing of those options. You know, I think they could have tried to coax someone, you know, like Ryan Fitzpatrick out of retirement or something. But it's like, you know what you're getting with Fitzpatrick. And it's probably like, if he's healthy and good, like he's probably ruining your draft pick. And like, there's no upside long term either, because it's like you've got Fitzpatrick for like one more year until he retires again or something. With Mariota, it's like if everything went right and he actually ended up playing quite well and impressed you, and the team had like a a really good season out of nowhere, sort of miracle situation happened. Like you could be like, okay, well we're gonna pick up his option, and you know Mariota's not this player on the verge of retirement, so 
Um, yeah, he's he? only he's, 28. He's like, yeah, he's 28. So, like, he's a reclamation project, possibly. So, I, I like that going, you know, that's why I would have been in favor of, like, a Mitch Trubisky, too, if they had decided to go after him. Because it's like, this is a guy that's young, that has had good tape in the past, that clearly had the talent at one time. Uh, I mean, Mariota's number two overall pick was thought of as, like, a can't-miss prospect. Um, you know, di- had some flashes, also had some injuries, and then you know, the rest is history with that. But, like, he's at least somewhat interesting. I think he's going to be functional. He's going to be at least a, a decent starter. You know, he'll have his his bad games, I'm sure, too. But they could have done a lot worse, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I think Mariota will at least keep this team watchable, which for us that cover everything, that's important, you know, for us. <laughs> like, I don't want to watch this total train wreck every single week. I mean, please. Please make it at least watchable. You know, if you're going to lose all the games at the end, at the last minute, and it's a hard-fought, you know, Lions-type season where they, like, end up losing all these games, but they're, like, sort of feisty, you know, I'm okay with that. But, like, I would like them to also be feisty and not just get rolled over every week. So I think Marietta gives them a decent chance of, of having that sort of uh, that sort of play, you know, that sort of level. Um, and, you know, by all accounts, he's a good dude. Um, yeah. And I think if, if a rookie came in and ended up taking his job— you know, I think he'd he'd be okay with that. But I think he's also just happy to get a chance to start. You know, he's probably like like Aaron said, like this is he's probably gonna be the week one starter, regardless of who they draft. Like I would be shocked if they drafted Willis. Not shocked that they drafted Willis, but shocked if Willis came in here and then was starting over Marietta in week one. That just I don't think that's gonna happen. So um the only guy I could see starting over Marietta if they drafted him would be like Kenny Pickett, just because Pickett's so sort of pro ready, but even him, it might not be a slam dunk that he just immediately starts over Mariota. So, um, but yeah, uh, interesting signing, interesting player. Don't hate it, you know? And the fact that he signed within like 30 minutes of the Ryan trade shows you that they had like had this in place before Mm -hmm. the trade went down. So, um, sort of like the AJ McCarron signing after the first round of last year's NFL draft. So, um, All right, let me get to a couple of these tips before we move on to our next signings. Uh, We got Corey Carter with the $5. Thank you so much, Corey. He says, uh, Michael Rothstein came straight at Fontenot and Smith today in the press conference, asked them if they had researched the allegations and and contacted the defense attorney, already knowing that they hadn't, and it was awesome. The journalists today were really trying to get answers. Yeah, Gina Thomas, our reporter as well, uh, spoke with the uh, the attorney for Watson's accusers. Um, and got some more information there, basically, uh, that no team has contacted him or tried to speak with any of the women or anything like that. Uh, And I know Gina will have an article on that and what she learned there uh, coming out. So if you're interested in reading more about that, I'm sure it will be up at some point this week. I think she said tomorrow. Yeah, it might even be as early as tomorrow, aka Thursday on the site. So definitely check that out. Um, And I appreciate these journalists like... Corey said, going out and, and finding the truth about this stuff because this is information that we need to know. You know, we need to know what what have they done? They, they claim to do this thorough investigation and from what we've heard so far, the investigation was anything but thorough. So um, mm-hmm. thank you again for that, Corey. And then one more from Corey real quick before we move on. Uh, he says, uh, we are one of two teams negative against the cap right now. Seems like the next move may be to trade Jarrett to get under also can't understand why Sheffield is still on the roster paying a fourth cornerback that much as a luxury they can't afford. Yeah, 100% agree, Corey. I don't know why Sheffield is still on the roster. Also don't really know why Mike Davis is still on the roster. It may be that they were sort of trying to see how everything shook out before they officially moved on from these guys, but um, I think they're the Falcons are actually only negative when you consider the price of the draft class. I think technically they're still... Uh, under the cap, like they're still positive because these signings can't be processed if it would take the team negative. So either some of these signings haven't officially gone through yet, or it's considering the price of the draft class in these calculations. Um, I know some of it, Kevin, is they haven't. Pro- if you go to websites like Spotrack and Over the Cap, mm-hmm. it's because they we don't know the details of Jake Matthews's re- yeah, uh, extension, yeah. and that hasn't been calculated yet. And so I yeah. think that's why the Falcons are probably a few million under the cap yeah, uh, yeah. than what they're currently listed at. But exactly how much that is, is really heavily dependent on, on Jake Matthews. Yeah. Yeah. T- so yeah. And that's exactly what Aaron said. Like they're, they have some kind of money cause they can't be negative. Like now that the new league year has started, they can't be negative. If any signing were to take them negative, the league would not allow the signing. So 
they're not negative really, but they're definitely not flush with cap space either. We just don't know exactly how much they're working with until these details, the Jake Matthews thing, uh, sort of sort of come out. Um, all right, moving on now to the next signing, an interesting one I think. Uh, Lorenzo Carter, the edge rusher, outside linebacker, uh, most likely, most recently of the Giants, I believe, came on quite strong at the end of this season. I think he had five sacks in five games or something like that. Um, I haven't had a chance to watch him much. I know he was getting some hype from people before the Falcons even signed him as like sort of a buy low sort of sleeper guy. Uh, Aaron, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at Carter at all or what do you, what do you think about that signing? I watched a little bit of him because he was a player that I had on my free agent wish list a couple of weeks ago in Locked On Falcons as a guy that really, I think, fit the similar role to what Steven Means played this year as sort of that more of that Sam outside linebacker that you know plays the run will drop into coverage um, and also rush the, the quarterback occasionally. Obviously, uh, you hope that Lorenzo Carter could be a little bit more productive as a pass rusher than what Steven Means was this past year. Um, and, you know, f- for me, sort of looking at his projection and his production these last couple of years, like he's probably a guy that's going to be like a five sack guy and, and get you 30, potentially 40 pressures. Uh, that's kind of where he's consistently uh, sort of hung his hat with the Giants and whatnot, hasn't truly developed into a um, you know, a, a difference maker as a pass rusher, but he's familiar with his coaching staff. The Falcons D-line coach, Gary Emanuel, uh, was the Giants D-line coach when they drafted him a couple of years ago. So I think he's a, a player with some upside if he can be continued to be developed as a pass rusher, but I think really does fit sort of Dean Pease's scheme in, in terms of being that sort of three-down player that can give you plus value against the run. Uh, on early downs, drop into coverage and or rush the quarterback. So I think this is a, a solid signing. It's not going to necessarily really move the needle, I think, overall in terms of the Falcons making significant gains in terms of their pass rush. Uh, but, you know, I, I certainly think it is a solid move for the Falcons and we'll see if they can add other, you know, pass rushers before the draft or if that's something that we're going to have to rely on uh, once we get to the end of April. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I like the signing but mostly because the Falcons literally had nobody at edge other than, Ogundiji. Uh, so like Carter is like a starting caliber player. He's not like a super high level pass rusher necessarily, but he's a solid guy. I mean, I think in general, you'd probably want him to be like your third edge probably <laughs> like that's probably where you'd like him to be. But as a second edge, I don't think he'll be bad. And again, like Aaron said, good run defender uh, has some flexibility to drop, drop in coverage a little bit. He's definitely that sort of three, four line outside linebacker that this scheme is going to use. Um, you know, he has a little bit of upside. He did sort of seem to turn it on at the end of this season. So it's possible maybe he's just finally growing into his own as a pass rusher. I wouldn't necessarily depend on that, but you know, I think he's a good guy to have in here with Ogun Deji, who you're hoping takes a little bit of a step forward. And then, you know, hopefully at least one draft pick, maybe two, this is a good class for it. So, you know, if the Falcons add Jermaine Johnson and, you know, Nick Benito or somebody else on day two, and then you got Lorenzo Carter and Okandiji. It's like that you could squint and that could be like a decent, you know, edge group, maybe, uh, which is a far cry from what it's yeah. been anytime yeah. recently. So, <laughs> so it's like he's a building block, you know, I guess is what I'm saying uh, for, for the future, perhaps something, something that could, if you combine it with some other things, maybe gives you the potential to be at least solid at that spot. But Evan, what do you think about uh, the addition of Carter? To the, to the edge group. I mean, it's something that was needed. Um, from what I've seen, he's pretty good in coverage. Um, he had five sacks, I think, last year, which is, you know, <laughs> on this team would be pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not much more I can add that Aaron didn't say. Um, but, I mean, I, I like the signing. Um, they needed to do something there. Uh, yeah. so, and let's say, you know, do something in the draft. But. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have like a strong opinion on it or anything, but Yeah. No, no worries. Uh yeah, I mean it's just sort of an interesting signing and a very necessary one, as you said. Like they needed to get starting caliber edge rushers because they didn't have any. Now they have at least one going into the draft, you know, and they can see how it shakes out. Um mm-hmm. and you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more, I'm sure, today. Uh let's see. So we get to a couple more tips here before we move on to the next signing. Uh, we got Nico <laughs> saying, uh, basically, uh, was that the best com- press conference that Fontenot and Smith could muster? Uh, basically calling the team a coward for how little they shared in that press conference. And I echo your sentiments uh, there, 
100%, Nico. Uh, that was a pretty sad press conference. They wouldn't even really mention Watson at all or anything to do with it. Not that I'm surprised they did that, but it, it you know, if you if you haven't, I retweeted it. Greg Rosenthal, the NFL Network reporter, one of the hosts of Around the NFL, uh, sort of went off on the Falcons and how they just have messed with the fans and, and they just need to be honest with the fans now. And they weren't. Um, so if you haven't seen that yet, it was like maybe 90 second clip. It was really good. I, I retweeted. So I would check that yeah, out. Yeah. He sure. was basically saying, I saw some of it um, basically saying, you know, they're treating the fans like the fans are stupid or something. Yeah. And I can't disagree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of embarrassing right now. Um, we also got Corey Carter again with the $3. Um, so, yeah, saying uh, if you watch the presser, Fontano said they couldn't pay Ryan, like they couldn't keep Ryan under that contract number. But then I don't understand why they thought they could go and pay Watson or why they were planning to restructure Ryan if they, quote unquote, couldn't pay him. Well, the restructure of Ryan was like they acknowledging that they couldn't pay him that amount and keep him on the team, which is why they did the restructure. It was also a sign that they were not committed to Ryan past this year. Because if they were, they probably would have extended him or something like that. Um, so they were sort of just in a weird spot. You know, I th- that's why I thought they probably should trade him before this bonus kicked in. Um, because it was sort of, I thought, the right time to do it. I, I like the quarterbacks in this class more than most. So um, that's why. But yeah, I mean, it, it trading Ryan and then turning around and paying Watson, uh, probably a really large contract, which is probably what it, what it would have taken to, to get him in here. Um you know, it, it's sort of just trading one expensive deal for the other. My guess is they thought Watson was going to provide them better on field compensation and he's younger, et cetera. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to justify, right? I mean, it's like, if you're trying to go cheap at quarterback, just go cheap at quarterback. They're just trading one for the other at this point. So financially, you know, it, it's, it's sort of weird. Um, Solaire, I don't know if I, I don't know if I should save that one for when Pat gets here, but he says I'm just here to give a shout out to touchdown balls Demarco. Thank you, Gina, for that golden line. Yes, I'm very tempted to ask uh, Pat Demarco about his balls um, when he gets on here, but I don't know if I'll have the courage to do so. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But <laughs> that was a legendary uh, locker room moment. One of those one of those locker room moments you just can't replicate. You know, it's just too perfect. Um, all right, let's move on to the next signing. Uh, Falcons, it was just, I think it was this morning or last night, uh, the Falcons re-signed safety Eric Harris, who had a season-ending injury right at the end of the season. Um, he seems to get all this hate from the fan base, which I find strange. Like, I know he can't catch picks, guys. Like, that that's his one we- That's his weakness. But, like, Harris was fine, I thought. Uh, he's got good size. He has pretty solid range. He basically did everything the team asked of him at safety and I think played at a pretty solid level overall. So like him as your, as a starter or your third safety, I think is totally fine. I like the re-signing. Um, Aaron, what do you think about Harris? I think I remember that you were a fan of Harris and wanted to bring him back, but I, I don't yeah. remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I went into the season very low on Her- Eric Harris. I was like, Oh, this defense could be a disaster starting Eric Harris <laughs> based off of what I saw from him with the Raiders and his inability to defend deep balls. And I was just like, Oh, this is going to be bad. Right. And very disappointed that Richie Grant didn't win the starting job and all this. Bit. So had a lot of negativity. And then when he got on the field, I thought he played well. Like, again, I'm not going to say and tell you that he was a superstar, but like the, the way I always described it was like he embodied the do your job mantra that Dean Pease was, you know, bringing from that Patriot, you know, school of thought uh, where it's like if you want him to play, you know, against the run in the box, he can do that. If you want him to cover slot receivers, cover tight ends, he can do that. He can play deep. You know, like he, he did whatever the Falcons asked him. He didn't do all those things at a super high level. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. You know, but like he did them competently enough that it didn't break your defense uh, whenever he was out there on the field being asked to do these various roles. So I thought he did a, a really solid job. I think, as you said, you know, if you're getting him back on like a one year, you know, one, one and a half million dollar deal or, or whatever the case may be, even going as high as $2 million or whatever the case may be uh, to potentially, you know, challenge for a starting spot or be a, a backup. He can play special teams. Like, you know, he, he, he checks a lot of boxes and I, I feel yep. like he's a solid re-signing uh, and, and I'm with you, Kevin. He got a lot of hate uh, this past year uh, for some dropped interceptions, but we know that, you know, Falcon fans will, will hate anybody that drops interceptions because Desmond Trufant had a lot of hate over <laughs> the course of his career for dropping interceptions. Thomas Deku before him had yep. a lot of hate for, for dropping interceptions. 
Uh, so that just kind of comes with the territory. Uh, yeah. But I, I do think it's a little overblown, at least yeah. from the fans' perspective. Yeah. Look, if they could catch, they'd be playing offense, all right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's how this works, all right? If they're on defense, that means they can't catch. So <laughs> that's at least how it worked in Little League. But, um, you know, it, it's always a little bit overblown, but that's how it always is for defensive players. Nobody remembers the 30 snaps where they were doing their job. It's always the blown coverage that, everybody, that sticks in your head. Even so. if he just ends up as, like, a depth guy, if somebody – you know, replaces him in the starting rotation. Like it's, he's not terrible, <laughs> like to where it'd be like, we don't want him on the roster at all. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. I think we got Pat is here a little bit early. So I'm going to get through these couple tips real quick and then I'll, I will get him in here. So we can start that conversation. Um, so we got Ray moon with the $5 asking, uh, Felipe Franks and Malik actually have similar college stats and bring somewhat of a similar game to the NFL. Only difference is competition. With one pro year already under his belt with Franks, do you think Malik still has more upside? I mean, I would say so. I mean, Franks, like, you're you're not wrong in that both are, like, good athletes um, and both actually have pretty strong arms. Um, I think Malik is a much better runner. He has much better instincts as a runner. He's much more effective as a runner. Franks had the athleticism to be a great dual threat. He just never did it well. Like, he's just not an effective runner, or at least wasn't in college. Like, his yards per carry is kind of pitiful, actually. Um, so I think he doesn't have the rushing upside that Franks says, even though he actually has the athleticism to make it work. Um, and I do think Malik's arm, like, Franks has a very good arm. Malik has, like, a special arm. And, like, no, it's not because he did this one throw at the pro day. Like, he does that sort of throw on the field. He did it at the senior bowl repeatedly. Um, and you just see scouts jaws drop. I mean, his arm is really special. It's sort of effortless how he does it. Um, and I think that's sort of the thing that teams drool over combined with his sort of off structure playmaking ability, which is kind of all the rage these days. Um, so I think there's a reason Malik is viewed as this much higher level prospect than Frank's, even though Frank's played against a higher level competition seems to test out also as a pretty good athlete. It's, it's the way that they go about doing these things. Like Frank's is a super inconsistent quarterback with his accuracy. Cause I think he's sort of a one speed thrower. Um, he throws the ball too hard, you know? Um, and he's just not a very effective runner. Like, I don't know if it's the instincts or what. He just doesn't move particularly well despite being a good athlete. Whereas Malik is just a really natural, really gifted runner. Like, if you told me you wanted... Like, Malik didn't work out as a quarterback. He could be your starting running back, I think. Like, <laughs> that dude is a really good runner. He has great instincts for it. Um, but, you know, I don't think you would ever want Franks to be, like, a full-time running back or anything like that. So, the, just the, the level of their the level of the level play is just sort of different, even though I think Franks did play against a higher-level competition. Um, and then, let me get to George Costanzas, who I know, I just know he's going to talk about Jordan Davis. I'm pretty sure he does. <laughs> Thank you, George, by the way. He says, if you want to make significant gains in the pass rush, pass rush drafting Jordan Davis to absolutely revamp the D-line is a great... Uh, great idea. Also, watch Fowler go back to 10 plus sacks this year in Dallas. Somebody should call him the Sticky Bandit because he just ripped off the Falcons. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't shock me. You know, I think Fowler can be like a solid uh, pass rusher, like elsewhere, if he has talent around him. As like the only pass rusher, definitely not going to work. So, um, all right, let me see. Oh, oh no, I wonder if I let. There he is. He's back. Okay, never mind. Crisis averted, guys. All right, yeah. I will make sure we get to the rest of the questions. And we had a couple more after we talked to Pat. I uh, just want to respect his time. I don't know exactly how how long he has. So let's bring him in. Patrick DeMarco, folks. Hey. Hey, what's hey. going on, guys? Hey, how you doing? I am good. How are y'all? Good. Yes. So I'm Kevin. Uh, Kevin Knight. Uh, you won't see me. That's totally normal. Just want to All let right. you know right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. The streaming software uses my video, but I'm sure you can see the other guys. Evan, I'm sure you've already talked to, uh, Evan Birchfield. Yep. And then Aaron Freeman uh, at Falk Fans. He's a huge yep. fullback fan and a huge fan of yours. So I know he's excited <laughs> to talk it. to you I too. Love it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, Pat, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah. I, I want to open up the floor to you guys. I know you guys have questions um i think we have some questions from fans as well so yeah if you guys want to get us started i'll pull those up and we can uh, get going here awesome aaron yeah big fan of uh patrick demarco big fan of all fullbacks i remember having a conversation with uh obi mahaley several years ago when you first uh, joined the falcons and we talked about how you know you were really making big strides 
uh, going from sort of an undrafted free agent. And then, you know, a few short years later, making the Pro Bowl. Uh, I'm curious from your perspective, sort of what were some of the things that sort of motivated you in those early years and, and sort of helped you make those sort of leaps early in your career? Yeah, so, I mean, I was coming up, I was a two-star coming out of high school, and uh, I, I went to South Carolina on a full scholarship, but, I mean, I think that was a surprise to most people in the SEC. I wasn't highly recruited, so I'm kind of always used to being the underdog, and I always kind of had that chip on my shoulder um, that I'm just going to prove people wrong, um, and that carried over. I mean, I started for four years in the SEC, you know, I thought I would have had a chance to get drafted. I ended up going undrafted. Started my NFL story was a little different. I undrafted as the lockout year 2011 to the Chargers. I broke my foot the third day of training camp. Um, they cut me. They released me. I, next year, I signed with the Kansas City Chiefs. So I'm practice squad for 10 weeks. We went 2-14. and 14. I got cut there. And then uh, the Falcons ended up calling. So my story was different. I was I just cut, I cut him through the chip on my shoulder. There was always I, I was just trying to prove people wrong. I was tired of being told I wasn't big enough, strong enough, fast enough. Like I had the demeanor that I was just going to prove people wrong. Um, and, and then coming in like, you know, I, I was lucky enough to play in the Shanahan um, kind of offense for two years, which which really blossomed my career playing in the wide zone scheme. Um, you know, it, it didn't necessarily use my size, more use my athleticism and my brain. Uh, they were able to kind of utilize those things, which helped my career take off. Um, so I, I would kind of contribute to that, that stuff. But I think mainly it was just kind of the chip on my shoulder and I was just going to prove people wrong. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I know I had a question. It's about the Shanahan system because, you know, generally as a fullback, you're out there to block, you block, <laughs> all that stuff. What was it like getting to finally come someplace where – Shanahan was like, oh, yeah, we're going to throw you the ball. Uh, how, you know, because obviously you have the athleticism, you could catch. Uh, but what was that like to actually get a chance to show those skills off? Yeah, it was um, it was cool. We were able to do some different stuff out of different sets, which I think really gave defenses fits. Uh, we were able to get in 21, 22, 13 big people personnel, get base defense on the field. And we had a lot better athletes on the team than me. So we were able to get those players better matchups because I was on the field. So I wouldn't say I was – um, I wasn't the primary target in a lot of those plays. I was more of the third or fourth guy. And it just ended up Matt Ryan. Um, uh, just, I guess, like me and he knew I had about 10 yards of space so he could throw it to me. But, um, you know, we were able to do some really cool stuff, getting in, tw uh, getting in 21, getting an empty, motioning back into the backfield, doing stuff to really put Julio in good situations, put Roddy White in good situations, Muhammad Sanu, Devontae Freeman, the guys that we really want to have the ball in their hands. Funny story, my dad would always, when I was playing, would always get, like, pissed off after games. He'd be like, Pat, you were wide open. I was like, Dad, I was the, <laughs> I was the fourth target. Like, I want them to throw it to Julio before they throw it to me. Julio can take it 80. I'm going to take it eight. So, big difference. Um, so, I mean, I was just – I was, it was really cool to do my part in the system. Like, it's, it's all the system, especially now that I'm coaching. Like, everything's about the system and, and you play the play. So, um, and we had a really darn good quarterback doing that. So, it really helped out. Absolutely. Yeah. Evan, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, it's kind of generic, but who, you know, you played with a lot of interesting characters in Atlanta. Who was like some of your, I'm not going to just say one, cause I don't want you to leave anybody out, but who was some of, you know, guys that pop in your head when you think about your time in Atlanta? Oh man. You know, really that the 2016 season was so much fun um, from, from not just a winning standpoint, but from, just the group of guys and, and the camaraderie and, and the, the togetherness that we really had. So I, I would have to say the running back room was, was incredible. I was surrounded with not only really talented players and Devonte and Tevin and Teron Ward, but like super human beings, like great people, stuff, people that I learned a lot of stuff from life lessons. And we really poured into each other and we loved each other. So I, I have to lead it off with that running back group. I mean, I still talk to, to all of them probably monthly. Um, so I would say those guys for sure. And then I came in with Levine Toilolo and Paul Warlow. So I was with them all four years and they were, they were rookies and that was my third year. Um, and, you know, I was, I was hurting on P squad. So I was treated like a rookie. So they put me in with the rookie dorms. 
for that first training camp and everything. So I really bonded with those guys. And I was really on a pretty similar platform as them, uh, being a young guy, still trying to prove myself uh, in the league. So I really bonded with them. And then playing fullback, kind of running back tight end, I bonded with the tight end room a decent amount too. So Jacob Tammy, um, I enjoyed playing cards and we had, we had a good card group. Um, so a bunch of the offensive linemen and a couple of quarterbacks played cards. So, you know, Jacob Tammy, Ryan Schrader, um, Andy Levitri, Alex Mack, Chris Chester, uh, you know, Matt Ryan, Matt Schaub, um, a lot of guys, we played a bunch of cards. We hung out a bunch. Um, it, it was cool. I would say the biggest, the coolest trip that we had, which a bunch of people kind of complained about, uh, we went and played Denver and Denver. Um, and then we went straight to Seattle. We didn't come back to Atlanta. We just went to Seattle and we practiced all week in Seattle. And I thought that was probably the biggest week for us as a team building time. We had Monday and Tuesday off. So we were able to tour Seattle and go out and do this. We were able to go out one night with all the guys. Um, so just stuff like that. Those are memories that I'll have forever and stories I'll have forever. Um, so I, just that 26, 2016 team in general, um, there's a lot of characters along the way. Obviously, the beginning of my career uh, in Atlanta, there was a, a lot of really big-time players that influenced my career too. Steven Jackson, Jason Snelling, Jaquiz Rogers. Um, Tony Gonzalez, Chase Kaufman, a lot of really guys that were big influences on my life. So um, probably too much to say. So sorry if I left a couple of, a couple of the guys <laughs> out okay. if they are listening. Um, but uh, it was a really special time, my four years in Atlanta. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I that 2016 season was special for all of us. I just, the, uh, the NFC Championship game happened to be on my birthday. So that was a great birthday. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, believe it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was a good one. Uh, so that's probably never going to be topped. That that was a great that was a great experience. But um, I know we had some fan questions I wanted to get to. I know Ray Moon asks from the chat, uh, "What was your most memorable touchdown?" Oh, there aren't too many. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would probably say it was. Uh, so I scored two touchdowns in a game, which is like unheard of for a fullback especially when I'm not, I wasn't getting that many carries. Uh, so I caught two touchdown passes against Indy. I want to say that was in 2015. Um, and I would probably say the second one, the first one was like a goal line uh, where I, you know, I bluffed the defensive end, the running back comes in and cuts him and I beat the backer to the flat. Um, that was the first one. But the second one we ran like a, it was like we caught two plays in the huddle. And if we got the, the look for the second play, we were going to speed up and run it. And it was a play where, like, the whole offense was trying to pick for Julio. And, like, and we're all picker. Like, we all run pick routes for Julio. And Julio runs into the Mike linebacker, and nobody ends up covering me when I run, like, a corner out <laughs> up the back end. So, I, like, I run my corner out, not really thinking I'm going to get the ball because I never got it in practice. And I kind of turn around, and I see Matt rolling left, and I'm like, holy cow, like, I'm wide open. And I kind of peek inside, and I see Julio on the ground. I'm like, holy cow, he is going to throw it to me. <laughs> and it was probably a 15 yard catch, but the ball just kind of floated. And I was like, oh, just catch it, just catch it, just catch it. Yeah, yeah. And, um, um, so that was a cool one just because it was super unexpected. Um, I actually won player of the game that game because I somehow scored two touchdowns, which was which was pretty cool. I actually bought my wife some diamond earrings with, with the gift certificate from that. So that was pretty cool. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. No, it's funny. I think people that have never actually caught a pass like in a live football game, it's like it's all fun in games until you're standing in the end zone wide open and the ball's coming because it's oh. like, oh, now I just can't drop. Like I cannot drop this, and then that's when you're most likely to drop it. So props to you for not dropping it. So oh, I, I dropped one in um in 2014 <laughs> when we were playing the Panthers, and it was to get into the playoffs. And same thing, I ran like a flat route, and I uh, just I. Uh, it was kind of a back shoulder throw and I, you know, catch up made a million times and I went to kind of turn the knife up field. Cause I knew somebody was chasing me from behind the ball right through my hands. And I like one, I was like, I'm so critical on myself and my own play. And, and then, so the first day that the new staff got there, Bobby Turner and Kyle Shanahan, they, they kind of met with the, the players and Bobby T's it was the first play he showed me. He's like, Oh, what happened here? I'm like, Oh <laughs> God, I got to read this again. Oh no. Um, yeah. But but it was cool because it was, you know, criticism I needed and I needed closure on that play. And, you know, my career after that, uh, you know, w was kind of trending upward. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Open the floor back up to you guys if you have any more questions. 
I have a question about the business of football. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, given that that's been a pertinent topic here in Atlanta these last couple of days, uh, it was my personal mission to make everybody in the world know that you leaving in 2017 was like a huge deal and would, you know, potentially affect sort of the identity of the offense. Cause I thought you were sort of integral in all the things that you already talked about with what Shanahan was doing with those different formations and running the football. Um, I'm curious sort of your perspective on sort of what led to that departure and, and sort of the business of football and, and not being able to take some of these things personally, as I'm sure you probably wanted to finish your career in Atlanta and sort of your perspective on some of the things that have happened recently in Atlanta with Matt Ryan, you know, continuing his career elsewhere. Oh, that's a lot right there. <laughs> Aaron um, doesn't mess around with these questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's, he's coming in hot. Um, so I, I guess my, I, I can speak on my story for sure. I don't know everything with Matt and, and the other guys, but um, you know, I was, it was my sixth year when I was finally an un, unrestricted free agent. So I, I was restricted after year four because I was uh, injured and on practice squad. So I was kind of handcuffed. Um, and they offered me a one year deal then and my agents, it, it, well, they offered me a two year deal. My agent wanted me to take a one year deal. And I ended up taking the two year deal, which got me to year six. Uh, and I was finally unrestricted and I was coming off, you know, pro Bowl, super Bowl. I was playing like my best ball. Um, and ultimately I wanted to stay in Atlanta. Like, you know, we, we had bought a house there. We had set our roots, you know, we joined a church. Um, you know, we, we had my, my son, Weston would just turn one. Um, so, I mean, in a perfect world, I would have stayed in Atlanta and, you know, contract stuff, is contract stuff, but I mean, it, um, and Atlanta offered me a deal. Um, they offered me a three-year deal worth, um, you know, it's, it's pretty similar to what the deal they gave Keith uh, Smith now. Um, and, you know, Buffalo offered me a four-year deal with more guaranteed money. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and I tried, and, and after Buffalo offered me, I, I, I came back to Atlanta, and I, and I was like, look, the contract's the contract. If we could just move somewhere on the guaranteed money, because, you know, I'm not going to hit free agency again. Like, that's uh, and at least not going to be a top-dollar free agent guy again. Uh, at least from the fullback standpoint. So uh, I was hoping there was going to be some wiggle room with the guaranteed money. Um, just maybe maybe make two of the three years guaranteed. Uh, we weren't able to settle on that. Um, so that was kind of the, the nature of the beast. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, contracts and, and, and how an organization set up with, with how they're allocating money and, and this and that, like it's, it's kind of the nature of the beast and they all have their own philosophy and their own, percentages per position so it, it you know I, I i can sit here and say like my career would have been different if i stayed in atlanta because i was playing better ball and i would have been using the kyle Hinch, the shanahan system and this and that but i'm also a, a christian and a firm believer everything happens for a reason um so i ended up doing four years in buffalo um you know we we had two kids out of it um you know we we're able to take care of our family financially uh, in certain instances. So, um, although I wish I, you know, I could have played in Atlanta for, for eight of my 10 years, um, you know, I played four and there were four darn good years and, and, I, and I'm super proud of them and, and everything we were to as accomplish as a team. Um, so, and then the Matt Ryan stuff, I like that's it's kind of over my head. Um, you know, he was there for 14 years. He was the epitome of what Atlanta is. Uh, he was a fighter through and through, um, you know, a, a leader, um, did everything the right way, loved the community, loved the city of Atlanta. Um, you know, I, I really missed him when I went and signed in Buffalo because we, we, you know, we didn't have that staple quarterback like he was that was leading, leading the charge and demanding excellence from everybody. So, um, you know, he's going to be missed not only up in Flowery Branch and in, and, and, and in the, you know, the new stadium, he'll be missed in the city of Atlanta and everything he's done from when it comes to the children's health care of Atlanta and all the stuff they did in the community. So, um, you know, I, I love that guy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's a lot of great Intel, a lot of great information there. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I, we had heard that you were offered a contract. Um, obviously we all wish it, it could have worked, but you had four great years in Buffalo. I mean, definitely. Hey, get the money, you know, <laughs> like you, like exactly what you said. Like you you only have so many opportunities to hit free agency. I don't blame you one bit, you know, get that guaranteed money. So, yeah. 
Um, we don't take it personally. You know, don't worry. <laughs> no. So, so, so funny, a funny story on that is, um, so I did a an, an externship through the NFL PA with uh, with Georgia Tech. Oh, uh, was probably two and a half, three years ago now, and it was a month long. I mean, we lived in Atlanta my whole time. I was in Buffalo. We'd come back for the off season. Um, and so I was doing the internship down there and one of the, you know, I was there for three or four weeks, whatever it was, but one of the days they were doing a, like a coach's clinic and some of the Falcon staff was in there. And it was the first time since, so my first year in Buffalo, we played Atlanta, uh, in the regular season in, uh, in the new stadium. And it was the first time since then that I'd seen DQ, um, and you know we were in the locker room and I saw him and I like I just lit up like I love that guy, so I went up and gave him a big hug and he kind of like was a little like taken back like 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 wow you're so <laughs> like you're so loving and so like giving me a hug and this and that and, and he ended up texting me later that day and he was like he's like Pat sorry like that was a little awkward like when you gave me a hug I thought that I had put up because when we didn't resign you in free agency and and everything that went down. I had put up like kind of a guard against you, not, not in you as an individual, but like, I, I didn't think that we were close personally. Um, and I told him, I was like, so dude, you changed my life. You changed my family's life in so many ways. Like I am forever grateful for you and everything that the Atlanta Falcons did for me. Like, you know, the business side of it's the business side of it and it stinks. Uh, and like, I didn't take anything, uh, any of that personally. Like, you know, I, I still love the Falcons, uh, organization. I still love all the coaches and the players I played with. Um, and he texted, and, and after that, he texted me back, and he's like, "In brothership, brother." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was it was pretty cool. I mean, I, I still talk with uh, with DQ a decent amount. Um, you know, like I said, he he changed my life, um, and he's kind of like now that I'm in the coaching world, I, I try to model a lot of the stuff I do and the, and the person I want to be and the role model I want to be around the stuff that I learned from Coach Quinn. So, um, you know, he holds a dear place in, in, in the DeMarco family's heart. Yeah, yeah, sounds like no hard feelings. So that's yeah. good. That's good to know because uh, the business side can be brutal and it beats it beats up every everybody, all the players. So I'm glad that uh, – I'm glad you were able to, to get, get your money, have another four great years in Buffalo and were able to – give us four awesome years in Atlanta too. So yeah, no um, doubt. Yeah. Guys, did you have other questions? I know. We yeah. Have I wanted questions. to, so go ahead. um, we had, uh, Paul Warlow on a couple weeks ago. He's, uh, coaching, I believe defensively at Delaware. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always find it fascinating, you know, a lot of former players who it's like their passion for football, just because maybe they stopped playing professionally. It's, they really show their passion by, trying to pass it down to others. So if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, I, 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 um, I didn't see exactly what you're coaching at South Carolina, but you're back at South Carolina, right? Yeah. So I'm working as a football analyst and college football is weird. Like you're allowed to have 10 on field or yeah, 10 on field coaches, a head coach. And then you're allowed, we have two GAs on defense and two GAs on offense. So those are the only on field hands-on coaches um, allowed on staff and then you're allowed to have analysts and QCs and this and that, but you're not allowed to do on field coaching. So you're more behind the scenes. You're doing the computer work. You're running all the analytics. Um, you're helping with the install and stuff like that. So I'm working with the tight ends and running backs, uh, here and also doing some special teams work. Um, but, but it's kind of funny how that all came to fruition because like when I, like everything I learned from the, from Bobby T and the Shanahan tree in, in Atlanta, I took to Buffalo and I kind of helped, uh, you know, Sean McDermott was, you know, he, he played against it twice a year when, when he was with the Carolina Panthers. So he asked me a bunch of questions and, you know, always kind of grilled me on everything that Shanahan was doing in the wide zone scheme and the play pass keeper game. Um, so I brought all that stuff, you know, up to Buffalo and passed it along. And he, like always he joke around with me. He's like, Pat, whenever you're done playing, like you're going to be a heck of a coach. And I'm like, coach, I'm not that crazy. I already lived this life for 10 years. I'm not moving around everywhere. I'm chasing that dream anymore. I'm going to go, you know, get into insurance or sell real estate. And have a steady, normal life. And he's like, ha, you say that now, buddy. And, you know, after I got hurt in Buffalo and I sat around the 2020 season, I was home for six months. I finished up 
the business uh, certificate school through the Kelly School with the NFL PA. And my wife's like, all right, it's time for you to get out of the house. You've been around too much. <laughs> and, and so I started pondering different opportunities, different options. And when Coach Beamer took the job here at South Carolina, he was uh, here from 2007, 2010 when I was here. Um, so we had a prior relationship and he called me when he got the job and he said, I want to get you back in some capacity. Um, you know, like I want you to think about it. And, and I know it's a big, big thing getting into the coaching world and this and that. Um, so think about it and, and, and pray on it and, and let me know. And, you know, honestly, I, I still went back and forth and I knew, like I knew I wanted to stay in sports in some capacity. Um, but I didn't like, I, you look at a coach's resume, it's awful. It's two years, it's three years, it's one year, it's four years. If you're somewhere for six years, you strike gold. Um, and I got a young, growing family now. So I kind of, you know, on a leap of faith came here to Columbia, South Carolina. And, you know, I'm going in on year two and we're having success. So hopefully we're here long term. Um, but, you know, it, it's been cool. It's like the reason I got into it and the reason I wanted to pursue college football is because you're working with 18 to 22-year-old men who – you know, like me, when I came here to South Carolina, I was lost. Like I, you know, you know, I had two parents at home, but, um, you know, I got off to college and I, and I wandered on my ways and I had some really good coaches and Robert Gillespie and Jay Graham when I was in college who poured into me and helped show me what being a, being a husband and a father looked like. So I kind of wanted to pass that down, uh, not just the football knowledge, but also like being a man in this world uh, to these guys. So, that's why I, you know, I really wanted to pursue the college ball other than uh, over professional ball. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. Yeah, great, great insight there. Appreciate that. Uh, we did have a question from Jason Gaines uh, asking, first of all, he says, Patrick, thank you for freeing up those running lanes for Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman. I personally think you should have been selected to the 2016 Pro Bowl over check. He just wanted to make sure you knew that. Uh, also, he asks, how different was it uh, in Dirk Cutter's offense for you compared to Kyle Shanahan's offense? Yeah, you know, um, there were some similarities, but I think, you know, we had different weapons with Dirk and a different scheme. Um, so I would say it was more like I was a I was a 234-pound fullback. I was probably the smallest fullback in the NFL at the time and probably currently still if I was still playing. Um, so, I mean, I, I was never going to be a 200 – like if I got up to 238, I felt like I couldn't run on special teams. So I like 235 to 233 was like my ideal playing weight uh, where I could move and do everything that was asked of me. Um, so I think in Dirk's system, it was more gap scheme. It was more kicking out big outside linebackers. Um, and it wasn't necessarily – I wasn't necessarily allowed to use my brain as much and, 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 and play freely. Um, like in Kyle's system with the outside zone, like – I would change it up. I'd cut every once in a while to slow a guy down if he was a downhill guy. I could throw my hat outside knowing that this guy was a contained player so that then I could wheel my inside arm and run him out. I could I could kind of manipulate things in Kyle's play or Kyle's system, uh, unlike Dirk's, which was more like you're going to run through this hole, you're going to run a four-yard dash through this hole, and you're going to hit this guy with your face. And I'm like, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> but right. when I got Kyle's system and I was able to use my brains and angles um, – it, it was, I was able to flourish a little more, but I mean, you know, I, I was, I'm a type of guy that, you know, I was an undrafted fought, fought to be on a roster. My first, you know, three, four years in the NFL, it was um, anything that was asked to me at that point, like I, I was willing to do it. So I remember one point in training camp in 2013, my first year in Atlanta, we, I think we got spanked in one of the preseason games and Dirk's like, all right, we're doing half line for 20 minutes. You know, and we're like, all right, what are we going to run? We're, we're going to run power. And I was like, shoot, I'm the only fullback on the roster. <laughs> so I was going right side, left side, right side, left side, right side, left side, <laughs> and just pounding outside backers. And, I mean, but that's like – that was a part of what brought me and taught me to be the player I am and the, and the grittiness I played with and all that. So um, different systems. And actually, Dirk came up to me that – uh, the second time we played Tampa in 2015 and he uh, pregame, he came up to me and he goes, dang, Kyle really found out how to use you. Didn't he? <laughs> and I was like, that's been pretty fun to play in this system. And he's like, shoot, I wish I would have done some of this stuff with you. So 
it was pretty cool to hear that from another offensive coordinator. That's great. That's very cool. Very cool story. Yeah. Did you guys have any other questions? I know we got a couple more fan ones, but I want to give you guys I, a chance to. I got one. Uh, it's a little bit more of a softball than the last one. Um, <laughs> you, you play with a lot of different running backs. Uh, Steven Jackson, Devontae Freeman, Tevin Coleman, Shady McCoy in Buffalo. I'm sure there are others. You've already sort of talked about what the schemes, different schemes were asking you to do. Were there sort of like subtleties and tweaks that you would do depending on which running back was on the field that you know, okay, this guy likes to do this. He likes to hit the hole this way. So that means I have to make some of these adjustments or was it just kind of like I'm just doing whatever I'm, I'm asked to do? No. So, I mean, playing with Devontae for three years, like we were able to develop a relationship where he he saw what I saw. We kind of like – we kind of had a weird feeling where we just knew where both of us needed to be and where we were both going to end up. Um, so, I would say we had the best relationship. We also watched a bunch of tape together. So, we knew when we were getting a three technique and the backer was in a 50 alignment. Like we kind of knew what we were going to do before the ball was snapped. Um, and obviously there's adjustments with movement and stuff. Um so I would say me and Free were most tied in um, to all that stuff. Tevin, I, 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 Tevin was just fast as all get out. So I knew if I, if I could give him with, with as fast and explosive as he was, if I could just give him a crease, like he was going to hit it a million miles an hour. Um, you know, I'm block, blocking for Shady. It's like you never know where the heck that dude's going to go. He's going to spin <laughs> out. He's going to hold the ball like a basketball, like – He's going to make 12 moves before he gets four or five yards, but he's going to, he's going to bust it for 12 or 15. So you never knew what you were going to get with him, but he was a super smart guy and he was able to see the second and third level probably better than any other running back I played with from setting stuff up. You know, I played with Steven Jackson who, you know, I caught towards the end of his career, but I learned a lot from him being a professional. Uh, was a big thing I took from, from, from Jack, uh, you know, played a year with Frank Gore, like, I played with a bunch like guys that are going to be Hall of Famers, which is pretty darn cool. Um, and I made sure I got jerseys with them too. I was like, "Hey, I don't want to be a fanboy, but let me get a jersey, please." Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, different backs, diff- different ways to block with different backs. Uh, but obviously, the longer you spend with the guy, the tighter you're going to be. The way that you're going to see stuff the same way. I was able to get that way with Shady in the year two. Um, which he still runs crazy, but we were able to get on more on the same page and see stuff the same way. Um, so yeah, I mean, my favorite guy to block for was free. Um, just, we had that interpersonal relationship and, you know, we still talk every month. You know, he called me two years ago on new year's Eve. Um, we just put our kids to bed and he, and he just rang me out of the blue and I, you know, I answered, he was in season cause he was with the giants. And I answered, I was like, what's up free. And he's like, Oh, I just got some takeout and new year's Eve. Um, you know, we got a game in two days. So I'm, I was like, what's going on? And he's like, that you were just on my heart. And I was thinking about you and I was riding back and figured we needed to catch up. We haven't talked on the phone. We texted back and forth, but we haven't talked on the phone in a while. And we talked for about an hour. My wife was like, she came out. She's like, what's going on? Like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm just catching up with my boy free. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, enjoy blocking for every back, but but free free definitely tops the chart. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a great story, Evan. Did you have any anything else? Yeah, um, I don't want to damper the conversation. <laughs> um, we'll focus more on the good side of it. But you know, not many Falcons in history have been able to play in the Super Bowl. Obviously, mm-hmm. I was just kind of curious how that week was for you. You know, playing at literally the highest level in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, it was incredible. Like, I'm not going to sit here. Like I'm, I love sports, like almost to a fault. Um, so being able to experience that, you know, my son was about to turn one, you know, my wife, my parents, family, friends, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody under the sun went to that game. Uh, so it was just an incredible experience from, from media day down there on the Houston Astros field and just experiencing that, the questions and the characters you see down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, we practiced over at Rice, um, just being kind of in a different element. Um, but, you know, honestly, other than all the Super Bowl media stuff, like it was a normal week. Like, yeah. you know, we were playing cards at night. We were hanging out. We were kind of doing the same old, same old that we would have done if we were on a normal away trip. Um, so, I mean, other than, you know, the last – quarter and a half of the game it was pretty darn darn good experience i mean I, it stinks how it ended up and you know mm-hmm. which i was a world champion just like you know every falcon fan or player out there 
Um, but I mean, I wouldn't change. Like, obviously, I'd like to have a ring, but other than that, like the journey and everything I went through and the guys, um, that was one of the hardest times in my life after that game in the locker room. Like, I had to, I had to put on my macho face and be there for the younger guys, especially Tevin Coleman who tweaked his ankle, and you know, free missed that one protection. Like those guys were, those guys were tore up, like like yeah. most of us were. But um, I had to put my my own emotions and myself to the side to be there for those guys because they were really in a deep place. And, you know, honestly, I didn't – I never got over that until probably my third year. You know, when, when, when I was my third year in Buffalo, we lost to the Texans again in a heartbreaker in the first round of the playoffs. In that same dang stadium, my locker was <laughs> two lockers down from where we lost the Super Bowl. Um, and it really hit me after that game. Um, that that I just I hate that stadium. I hate that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's um, bad but, NRG in that stadium. Yeah. You know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I yeah. Um, and, and honestly, I was after that game. I was sitting in the training room because I kind of tweaked my shoulder after that game. And I was sitting in the training room in Buffalo. We were you know last game of the season. Season's over. And I just like broke down. And like a couple guys that came up to me like, "What's going on?" I'm like. I never cried when I lost the Super Bowl in 2016. <laughs> They're like, really? I'm like, no, I put on such a stoic behavior and I like, I needed that like, and I just like, they gave me a big hug and let me cry it out. And, you know, five minutes later I, I was, I moved on, but, um, you know, still a lot of scars from that, but I, yeah. it's, it was such a cool experience. Like, mm-hmm. you know, even the Super Bowl party afterwards, like each team has a party afterwards, whether you win or lose, and like it was my last game I ever played as an Atlanta Falcon. Like, so I remember, you know, what I ate that day. I remember hanging out with the guys. I remember what drinks we had. I remember what we talked about, what music, the bands that were there. I remember all that. Like those are memories that'll last a lifetime. So I, I wish the outcome was different. Um, just like every Falcon fan out there, but, um, you know, I'm still super proud of what we did. Um, yeah. it, was, it was really cool. Can you yeah. describe, it may be hard to describe, but like kind of the, I guess as somebody who obviously has not played in a Super Bowl, it gives me anxiety just thinking of like the pregame, like leading up to like coming out on the field and stuff like that. Um, how was that for you? Like, did you were you super nervous? Like, even you know, leading up to coming out of the tunnel, sort of thing. Like, it what even during the game was it sitting there like on your mind, like this is Super Bowl, or were you like fully in game mode where you just I'm blocked not, it out? I kind of black like I'm. Like you guys can tell, I'm a pretty normal dude. Like <laughs> almost every day, I'm in on on game day. I just kind of black out for like four or five hours. My wife's like, "Who are you?" <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I kind of channeled that inner, like, you know, I got to go in game mode, like block out the distractions. But it was like my very first game that I played in when I was with the Kansas City Chiefs, like a little surreal moment, like the very first national anthem of that preseason game. I'm sitting there and I'm like. Holy crap, I'm playing in my first NFL game. Um, and then the opening kickoff, like that first pop, as soon as you get that first hit and your pads wake up, you're like, all right, I'm good. Yeah. Then, I, then I go in that mode. So um, everything leading up to it, like obviously Super Bowl back your mind. Um, but it, I, it was one pop I needed. And it, I think it was the very first play when Free ran like 50 yards uh, on like a little uh, toss sweep, uh, which I was like, okay we're good. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's terrific. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a crazy experience, I'm sure. And, uh, I agree. Like I, I'm not going to let the, the final moments ruin, you know, like I said, it's my birth, the NFC championship was my birthday. Like I'm not going to let that game, that memory be ruined because the final result wasn't exactly what you wanted. You know, you got to take the positives. That was the best season the Falcons have ever had may ever have hopefully there'll be one slightly better you know but <laughs> but I, I it doesn't dampen my enjoyment of the season so nah, yeah it was it, it was definitely special and i mean i think like i believe in arthur smith and everything they're doing and, and arthur blank is one of the best owners uh in the national football league so i mean they're 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 gonna work towards it and i know that they're gonna sell out and, and do everything they can uh to get back to it so uh, i'm excited for the future there i know it looks grim at times um but as as every coach says, you got to trust the process, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. you know, just get try to get better every day, uh, and continually get better. Absolutely. All right, we had a question from 
uh, patron George Costanza asking, was there a particularly memorable rookie skit or hazing experience that you remember from your time in Atlanta? Oh, time in Atlanta. <laughs> if there's other ones too, that's uh, also fine. But... <laughs> um, so Levine Toy Lolo like, has like a musical gift. Like he has the voice of an angel. Um, <laughs> and he, so I, I knew it because I was rooming with him his rookie year for training camp. But he, he has a ukulele that he would like sit in his, like he'd go in his room before he went to bed and he just plays ukulele for 15 or 20 minutes. And I could like hear him through the wall because the walls weren't that thick and, and the dorms back there. And he kept singing like the same song. And I'm like, something up with this. And then eventually like, <laughs> I forget exactly what song it was, but he had the entire team standing up, singing with him the song he sang when he was playing his ukulele. Like the whole room was rocking. And I think we asked for we asked for an encore. We asked for another performance after <laughs> that. And that was one of the – like, usually a rookie performance, they start, and then, like, everyone boos them, and they throw their water bottles at them, and, and then just make fun of them, make a joke of it. But, like, it was like a legit, like, two-song concert when Levine was up there. It was pretty – it was That's pretty awesome. lit. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it's funny because Levine is a large man. You know, this is a very tall person. And the ukulele is so small. It just looks yeah. so tiny in his hands in particular. So I always thought that was an interesting And he's extremely quiet, too. Like, he's not an extremely outgoing. Um, like, obviously, you peel back the layers with him. But, like, his his rookie year, like, I mean, he, like you had to ask him a question for him to talk. Um, like, he he wasn't the one going to approach you and, and talk much. Um, so when, when he pulled out the ukulele and, and, he, and he was strumming that thing singing, I, we were all like, holy cow, who is this dude? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, we had another question from Jason Gaines asking, uh, you played with the Bills from 2017 to 2019. Uh, did you know when you met Josh Allen that he would turn into the quarterback he is today? Or what, what were sort of your thoughts on Josh Allen? Yeah. Um... No, but yes, like, um, like you knew that he had the gift of leadership and you knew he had the gift of like bringing people together. Um, like he had that from day one, like he, he walked in the locker room and he just like had a, like an, an aura about him that like people flock to. Um, but obviously like coming from Wyoming and not playing against uh, superior talent like there is in the NFL, like they were going to be growing pains. And I think the best thing for him was like he was forced to play his rookie year, um, so he was able to get the, the good, the good and the bad out of the way, and and, and he had the growing pains early on in his career. Um, you know, going into year, you know, would have been year year four. Um, what was that in twenty twenty? He, him, and Brian Dayball like almost kind of completely changed that offense. Like it went into like Josh was a visual learner and was was not great at reading something and memorizing it he was able like he was better at like visually giving him one word and he could like draw a picture of it in his brain so they changed the offense around and catered it that way so it was a one word and that was formation motion protection play route like cadence everything was timed into one word and they really catered the offense around that and I mean, that was the that was the big jump in his career. And then obviously now he's played a bunch of ball and he's experienced it all. So now he can probably do whatever. But, um, you know, he he always had the arm talent. He always had the athletic ability. It was just about if he was going to be able to process it. And when they, when they slowed it down, they changed the one word stuff and they made it where he could learn at his best level. The, you knew the talent was there. It was just going to have to be all the mental stuff. And, you know, now, I mean, I put him up against any quarterback in the NFL now. Yeah, yeah, he's he's proven he was the quarterback I've been the most wrong about in terms of my evaluations because it was oh his college tape is not that great and there haven't been any that many college players that have, you know, struggled in college and then have come to the NFL and played, you know, had a better NFL career than their college career and he proved that, you know, wrong. Like he has had a drastically better NFL career and you know that's on him and that's on the coaching staff for for seeing what a player can be and not just what they are, which is one of the, the biggest things of scouting. It's you can't just grade what they were. It's what they can be. So, and he's a super good dude. Like he, um, you know, he was 22. I think when we drafted him, he was like, at times he was like a little fraternity, like not a little, little but a big fraternity, <laughs> like coming in and having parties at his house that he bought and like entertaining. And that was his way of like really bringing the team together. That was his team bonding stuff was, 
you know, being 22, 23 years old and outgoing and, and funny and, and all that. So um, he had, a, he had a special gift and obviously still has that special gift. Uh, and, and it's translate cause they're rolling there in Buffalo right now. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Did Evan, Aaron, you guys have any more questions for Pat? Uh, I had, there was a couple from Twitter. Um, one flew over to Falcon's nest on, that's a long at, but on Twitter uh, asked, um, can you please ask Pat tonight to tell the origin story of brothership from his time with the squad? Yeah. Like how that came about is pretty darn funny. So I was, um, what was that? It was 2016. And um, so Jacob Tammy used to do the team prayer, after after all the games um in the locker room and, and he got hurt for like two weeks or something he was down for a little bit and so dq like gave me heads up he said pat you're gonna leave some prayer after the game and we're all sitting there and we're and we're praying and you know as i'm closing up my prayer and i was like meaning to talk about like the brotherhood that we've developed and the friendship of the team and how it's and i just put the two words together i put brotherhood <laughs> and friendship together and I made brothership and I didn't even know I did it. Um, so after the prayer, I was like, all right, hey, amen. We all, we all brought it up in DQ. It was like, all right, let's break Let's bring it in. Let's break it down. Brothership on three. <laughs> so DQ <laughs> broke it down, brothership. And it took off after that. They made a shirt at one point, like with a, like a UFO ship and like put our faces on it um, and stuff like that. So it was, um, you know, it was a mix of two words and a blend of, two words together and we we broke it down brothership from then on out that game that game was in tampa when i when i did the prayer and i broke and i put brothership in the prayer <laughs> um and it just we just kind of ran with it which is pretty cool that's hilarious that's a good story that that's a good one for sure um yeah aaron any anything else I'm good. I've been enjoyed the the stories that Pat has, has told, so I'm good. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I I have one that I absolutely can't get out of here without bringing up, which is uh, the story of when uh, Falcoholic reporter uh, Gina Thomas asked you if she could take a picture of your balls. Oh, sure. um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I want I wanted to know. You know, obviously that's a really funny story. Uh, we yeah. still talk about that. But any any other funny moments like that with the press over over your years in the NFL? <laughs> Oh, uh, what, what year were we on Hard Knocks? Was that 2014? It was 14, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that was just a strange experience. Some <laughs> like cameras in places that we didn't know if the cameras were on or off. And we're like, we'll figure out if it's on. We'll do like, I'm about to go in the shower. Let's, let's do something real quick. <laughs> um, just little stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it's in, in all reality, we're a bunch of, you know, 22 to 35 men playing a kid's game um, and playing football. Like it, it's, it was such a cool experience to play into my – to be able to play into my 30s being an undrafted guy. Um, it, you know, it was super special. I didn't take a, a day for granted. Um, like uh, DQ, when they re-signed me to that two-year deal when, when DQ and them got there, and he was like, I know you're a lunch pail guy. Bring that thing every day. Um, and I told him when I signed that contract, I was like, yes, sir. You're like, I'll never, I won't let you down in that sense. Um, so, you know, honor to have won the, the, the red and black, uh, you know, Atlanta holds a dear place in our hearts. We spent eight years there, uh, living wise. We just moved back to Columbia, South Carolina from Atlanta, uh, this past July. Um, we still have a lot of friends in Atlanta, still a lot of ties in Atlanta, you know, it'd be pretty darn cool if, somehow down the road in my coaching career, if I end up back in Atlanta, that, that would be pretty darn cool in a special place. So, um, you know, I'm just going to keep plugging along, be, be tuned into all the NFL stuff. And then, you know, I keep track of the free agency and everything the Falcons and the Bills are doing because those are two organizations that I played with for a while. So um, I'm with you guys rooting on the Falcons. Um, I'm hoping good things for the future there. And you know, I got a really good buddy, TJ Yates, who's on staff mm-hmm. there still. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... I talked to him a decent amount. He's a really good friend of ours. Um, you know, they have two young kids, same age as our kids. So, um, I, you know, I'll always be a Falcons fan. So awesome. awesome. Yeah. Well, on the note of the team's future, we had a question from Brandon Brass. Do you have any uh, thoughts on, on where you would go with the first pick of the draft? If you were the Falcons, what, no, what number is it? Eight. Number eight. I mean, I, I'd probably go with a receiver. Like I, I, 
You know, you, you got you got Pitts, the tight end. You have some weapons in the running backs. Um, just when you look at the receiving core, like it's pretty dim and glim, a little gloom without having uh, Calvin Ridley. So I think you got to have somebody to alleviate um, kind of the coverage on Pitts. Um, and there's a bunch of good receivers in this class. So, um, I mean, I, I, I could either see that or I could see an edge rusher. Like, everybody's always looking for the next edge rusher. Um, yeah. So, um, they've invested a bunch of first-round picks in offensive linemen, and they reinvested in Jake Matthews. So, um, you know, hopefully if, if those guys play at a high level and can open up holes, uh, you know, for Cordell Patterson. And, and Mike Davis is still under contract for one more year, correct? Yes. You know, if, if they can if they can open up some gaps for those guys and pull those safeties up, like you'd love to have – a guy who can take the top off at receiver um, and then let, let Pitts be Pitts. Like the guys of what did Lee Smith call him a unicorn? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think they got to go receiver just to get another, another dynamic to the offense, but I wouldn't be surprised if they, uh, if, if they go edge rusher just because it's such a pivotal piece to a defense. Yeah, those two classes in particular are also two of the deepest ones. So, you know, if they go one, they could definitely get another quality player at both of those spots at, like, their second-round pick, too. And they have, like, I think five or six top 100 picks now. So they have they have an opportunity to get some good players. <laughs> All right, I'm going to flip it on you guys. Who do you guys want them to take? Or what do you, what just, do you guys want them to take? Oh, man, that's very controversial. But, you know, I, I, I lean – I know there's a lot of people that are a fan of a trade down, but you know, a lot of fans don't realize like it takes two to tango with that. So you can't really depend on that. Um, but I like, I, I agree with what you said about edge rusher. That would be at the top of my list. I definitely like the receivers. I don't know. I, the thing that gives me pause with receiver is that I don't know if there's like a clear cut top guy. There's a lot of really good ones. So part of me is like, well, maybe you should wait. Um, because I love like Jermaine Johnson from FSU. Like if he's there a day, I just love him. And he's just like a high level guy to me at receiver. It's like, I can't decide. Do I want like Drake London or do I want Chris Alave or do I want, you know, uh, Traylon Burks? You know, there's so many, it's, it's much like easier. The, yeah. <laughs> I like the Burks kid from, uh, from Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's good. dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, where, where are you leaning at eight? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in a similar mind. I, I like the edge rush, you know, I've been, Feels like I've been complaining about the Falcons needing to upgrade their pass rush for a decade, and so it's like any chance they get to to upgrade that spot, I'm always in favor of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. George Costanza says Jordan Davis, so we yes, George, absolutely. Yeah. We know George is going to be right. George correctly predicted the Kyle Pitts pick uh, back in like September of uh, 2020, so we have to give his prediction some credence. And he's been on Jordan Davis to the Falcons. Since about he, that time, that is a large human being. He should count for two draft picks. Was a big yeah, deal. <laughs> he's going to count for two offensive linemen, probably. So, <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't be upset with that either. There's there's a lot going on there. But uh, Patrick, yeah. how would you have tried to block Jordan Davis if you had to, to, to ask him? You just cut him. Um, you know, he probably wouldn't see me because I'm down so low. So maybe I could, like sneak attack him. <laughs> you know, usually when a fullback has to block a three technique or a shade, like something went really wrong yeah um, yeah so it's just kind of like throw your body as hard as you can into them and try to make them blink <laughs> Let the ball <laughs> <get blinked>. use <laughs> those <laughs> angles use those yeah. angles that kyle shanahan talked about yeah just try to make him <laughs> blink for a second let the running back get by him yeah yeah no there's only so much you can do you know for me it would be a business decision to just fall down and get out of the way yeah <laughs> i i was not built to block jordan davis on any level of the field so. i don't i don't think many people in, yeah. in your defense kevin would yeah be, no uh, built i'm not a, i'm not ashamed of that yeah i'm a little <laughs> bit ashamed but not not that much not that much to try to take on jordan davis one-on-one um yeah yeah any further questions guys we we all good. We've taken up a good yeah, we've taken up a lot night, of your time. So. Yes, oh, anytime, fellas. I you know I I love chatting football in any capacity. Uh, you know, I have passion for the Atlanta Falcons. So uh, anytime you guys want to do this again, feel free to give me a holler. Appreciate y'all having me on. Good. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks so much, Patrick. He is at Pat Demarco forty two on the Twitters. Anything that you're working on, anything you're doing, you want to let the people know about. Oh, uh, about to have another kid here in three and a half weeks. So, all right, Congrats. congratulations. congratulations. Number, number four coming. So, all right. Cool. What be, what what sex are they? Uh, we old Weston's. Uh, he's six. He's our oldest, and then we have two okay. girls, Sutton, who's three, 
uh, and Collins, who turns one on Friday. Oh, wow. And then we have uh, the last one's going to be a boy, and we are done. No more yeah, kids. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. Good call. Good call. Yeah. The, I I think I, there's a chance I can handle two kids. But, like, Oof. I remember also just having my brother around as a child, and that I, I already felt overwhelmed by that, not even taking care of another uh, young person. So, uh, yeah, I uh, respect it having having four so <laughs> all right yeah well thank you so much pat uh we're gonna Thanks, keep pat. keep going here on some other topics so you're welcome to stick around or you can I, I know you have a busy night so you're welcome to take off but we'll definitely get you back on we have a big draft show during the draft so at some point you're welcome to hop on for that as well so yeah i'd love that appreciate you guys all right man have a great yeah, night thank have you so a good much night, pat see y'all yeah, guys, patrick demarco great awesome. dude as you can tell great interview uh, a lot of fun to talk to him so uh yeah, yeah. Every, everything I expected. Everything I expected from Pat. Yeah. You could tell He's tell he was really a sharp nice dude. dude. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you guys. Yeah, Thank I knew it. Eric was Aaron, Aaron was right this whole time about <laughs> Patrick DeMarco. He was the secret, the catalyst to that entire offense and now that he's as soon as he left the whole thing went to shit and you know you're so right, Aaron. You're just so right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I got a couple of. I'm sorry, Corey, that we missed your last question. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, just just barely missing it there. Uh, I I do want to read it off. Uh, and when we get Pat on, uh, make sure to to include it. And I'll try to get it. Corey had asked uh, if if Patrick had felt the last four games of the Super Bowl season had sort of propelled them into the playoffs since the Falcons, you know, ended really strong that year. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that was definitely something that, that helped them out. Um, again, sorry, we, we I couldn't sneak that in. I, I felt like we were sort of stretching his time a little bit as it was, Corey, but we really appreciate the question. Uh, and like I said, when we get Pat, on, uh, Pat back on here, which I'm sure we will at some point, um, just make sure to – you can just DM me or put it in the chat or whatever, and I'll make sure we get it, um, get that in for you. Um, also, Jason Gaines was recalling a favorite Patrick DeMarco moment. His favorite was uh, 2016 against at the Panthers, sealed the edge on linebacker AJ Klein. That was the one that ended up freeing up uh, Tevin Coleman for a 55-yard rush TD. It looked so bad on the defense that uh, Chris Spielman accused Trey Boston of quitting on the play. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good a good memory um also got gary stafford with the ten dollars thank you so much gary by the way from before pat came on um just saying glad we didn't end up with watson definitely not a fan of giving up three picks for one player or five picks like the dolphins just did for hill uh for tyreek hill by the way in case you guys didn't know about that trade yeah that's a wild trade maybe we should talk about that a little bit the dolphins traded five picks for for tyreek hill that's pretty crazy right pretty crazy that offense looks fun though like at least from like a paper standpoint when you got waddle hill Jaseki, uh they signed chase edmonds um and then they still have Devonte Parker, who's you know, and then on their offensive line, who was it they added Armstead and yeah, Toronto Armstead, Williams. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they went all in this year, so like we're gonna yeah. know if Tua can play by the end of the season because there's, yeah, no there's no more excuses. There's no excuses. <laughs> there's no more excuses. I, for the record, think that he can play, but you know, will he play well enough to make it worth five picks for a receiver? I don't know that anyone and, can. And then also, you got to think they got. Um, uh, you know, a new head coach there, and uh, what was his name, McDaniel or whatever? Who yeah, was yeah, With yeah. the Falcons a long time ago during that's the, right, 2016. Mm-hmm. So he's got a lot of firepower in his first year. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, what do you think about that trade, Aaron? Would you would you ever consider trading five picks for a receiver? I feel like the Chiefs, you know, stole from the Dolphins. Uh, again, yeah, as good yeah. as Tyreek Hill, as good as as Evan pointed out, you know, they they are stacked. Uh, from a skill position player, they have a ton of speed uh, on the football field, uh, on the offense, and you know, the, as you were, as you say, like you know, we're gonna find out about Tua because like after this year, I think is his fifth year option, mm-hmm. so they're gonna have to decide based off of this one year if they believe in him or do they potentially pivot to somebody else next year that can be the guy that can lift them up into the postseason and, and, and potentially beyond. So it is kind of seems like an all or nothing sort of scenario. So I, I get why the Dolphins are doing it. They're, you know, they're trying to get to competition because these last couple of years where they've been sort of tanking and whatnot, which is applicable to maybe 
what some people <laughs> Hawkins doing uh, in the near future. Um, you know, like eventually, you know, you got to start delivering on, on some of these expectations. But for me, I, I look at the Chiefs and I, I say, look, Tyreek has been an integral part of their success. But I feel like Patrick Mahomes is the engine that drives that offense. And when you look at how much they were potentially going to have to pay him and, you know, the fact that you go back a couple of years ago when he was Tyreek Hill was hurt and that offense didn't skip a beat with like Miko Hardman and Sammy Watkins and all those guys. And I feel like in this draft class where you have a lot of fast guys like Chris Olave and Jamison Williams and Christian Watson and George Pickens and all these guys that are potentially going to be on the board for the Chiefs at the end of round one. And now they're going to be, uh, have two picks, I think, in, in, the, in the. Yeah, like, yeah. It's like 29 uh, and 30. Yeah. So it, it's one of those, like, if they want to go package those and, and go get somebody, I think it makes a ton of sense. I, you know, I think their offense is going to take a step back, but if they can use all those picks that they got to supplement their defense, which is really, I think, the area of the roster that really needs to improve, like, you're going to be fine on offense as long as. You, you protect Patrick Mahomes. Like, you know, that that's their – as long as he has time to throw, he'll find open receivers. Uh, yeah. So I, I think if they can turn those picks into upgrades across their defense, improve their pass rush, all that various stuff, I feel like that could be the difference between them getting back to the Super Bowl and potentially winning a Super Bowl uh, if that defense can make significant strides because I think that's the one thing – that has sort of held them back these last couple of years since they won the Super Bowl a few years back. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree with that for sure. Not, I might be making this up, but didn't Miami also have like two or three first round picks this year or no? Was it last was year? That somebody think? else. Wasn't no, they, they, had like... they had it. So, their pick is somebody's pick for the Philadelphia. I, I can't remember what trade. They made yeah. Yeah. Year. They oh, traded okay. up last year. They had a bunch of picks last year and they traded up for one. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's how the Eagles have so many picks this year. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it was from Tunsil or whatever. Um, okay. They had all those picks, but yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see how that, how that shakes out. And like everyone in, you know, it's been interesting because everyone was sort of saying like originally, Oh Yeah. The Falcons, their best chance to trade down is going to be for a team trading up for a quarterback. And now it's like, well, maybe it's going to be just a team trading up for some player that they really like. You know, the Eagles have all these firsts. You've got all these teams that might be trying to be move up for a receiver or the top edge guy, you know, with Ajabo getting hurt. All of a sudden, it's like, if you want these top tier edge guys, it's like after Jermaine Johnson's gone... You know who who are you taking like Karloftis and Ojabo? You know Ojabo's still going to get taken in the first round, but like he's not going to be able to play for you immediately. So all of a sudden it's like, oh well, maybe maybe the Falcons are going to be able to trade down with a team that's not looking for a quarterback. But um, you know, what do you what do you think the chances of a trade down, Aaron? Uh, two two percent? Is it high? More like two percent or eight point uh, two eight percent? Uh, oh, okay, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I think you you. I think we've talked about a little bit, Kevin, uh, about the edge, I think, being sort of your best option for a trade back at, at the Falcons, and particularly now that Ojabo is hurt and probably is not going to be a top 15 pick, so he'll slide somewhere in the lower half of the first round or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, I think you, you're looking at, you know, I heard rumors that Philadelphia really loved Ojabo and was potentially wanting to get him in, in, in the top of this draft where I think, you know, because we're not going to have quarterbacks going that high because we're not going to have other premium positions like wide receivers going in the top 10, you know, we could see four or five edges go in the, in the first 12 picks or yeah. something like that. Um, and so uh, particularly a team like Philadelphia, I know they went out and signed Hassan Riddick, but at least, you know, the people that I know that talk Eagles still think they'll be in the market to take an edge with one of those picks. If, if you start to see a run on these edges and, and, and Hutchinson goes in the top two, Trayvon Walker goes in the top two or three, uh, you know, Kayvon Thibodeau goes in, in the top, you know, five or whatever. And, and the Falcons are taking edge four potentially at eight in, in Jermaine Johnson. You know, all of a sudden, if you're Philadelphia and you're like, we really want an edge rusher, you know, um, or you're you're worried about the Falcons taking Jermaine Johnson at, at, at eight or whatever the case may be. Then if, if you're really worried about, you know, one of your top guys not being there, then maybe you potentially trade up and, you know, the Falcons can move back to 15 uh, may not get an edge rusher, but maybe that's where they get a wide receiver. Maybe that's where they feel a lot better about taking potentially a quarterback. Cause I still am skeptical that we'll see a quarterback go in the top 10. 
Yeah, um, yeah. You know, for George Costanza, maybe that's the perfect spot for uh, Jordan Davis or whatever the case may be. So I, I think certainly the Falcons, it makes a ton of sense for them to potentially move back just because they have so many needs and there still will be some some very good players in the middle of the first round uh, in this draft. So I, I feel like that edge position is probably the most likely bet if we're, if we're placing them in terms of trade back trade up options. Yeah, you know, maybe, for instance, someone in a mock draft may have done this hypothetical trade down to 15 with the Eagles, and maybe somebody may have taken a wide receiver there, possibly Drake London. Um, so this in this very hypothetical situation that you should look for the Falcohol look for on the Falcoholic in the next couple of days, but you know, a little tease there. Um what but yeah, might I mean, be the compensation in what if that could was hypothetically actually, uh, if that was an article that might yeah, what, be did you, what did you what did you put uh, or what what would you think this person would put in this hypothetical uh, article, Kevin? The second second round pick or something like that? Yeah, so actually it was it was considered to be good value for the Fal- uh, for the Falcons to get fifty one and I believe uh, eighty two uh, was was considered and that's fair from value eight to fifteen. Yeah, so they got fifteen plus fifty one plus mm-hmm. uh, eighty two or eighty three. I can't remember which one it was. One of them is from the Colts. One of them is from the. Uh, Eagles hypothetically, um, so they get a second and a third uh, for that for that move down. Which again, Philly probably doesn't care about because they got three freaking first round picks, so they don't care about that one second and that one third when they're going to be taking two other. Like they're gonna, they're not going to have enough picks. They're going to have too many player draft picks, not enough guys to make the roster. So um, they will be moving some of those picks, I bet. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that I think in in this hypothetical mock, the Eagles actually trade up for Derek Stingley. I think it's more likely they would do it for an edge. But um, you know, it's possible CB one could still be there at eight as well. And I don't think the Falcons are interested in the top cornerback now. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. But it, it, it's hypothetically very interesting. And hypothetically, you should look for it on thefalconhawk.com in the next couple of days. Um, but yeah, I did want to get. Uh, I missed one from Corey earlier. That I just wanted to get to real quick. Um, Basically asking, how could the Falcons not even get the better of the Colts' third-round picks? Can't understand that negotiation. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, I have no idea. Um, my guess is the Falcons were just, like, over a barrel, and they, I'm sure they asked for it, but the Colts were like, you're going to take whatever pick we're going to give you. Cause, right, they could have gave us even a worse pick somehow. Yeah, I think the Colts like, did we have no was. other. Yeah. Yeah, they did us a favor. It okay, could have been like, oh, we'll do a sixth. And it's yeah. like, well, our hands are tied. We have to accept it. So. Yeah. I mean, the Falcons were like, you need to give us at least a day two pick. Like if you give us less than that, it's just an embarrassment. It's like a, it's yeah. like an insult to Matt Ryan. <laughs> if you give us less than a day two pick. So they had to at least give us a third. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, Corey, they didn't get good compensation. There's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It was very poor compensation. So, um, Maybe they'll make up for it, and they can, you know, flip Calvin Ridley for some good picks, you know, in future years, and it'll it'll all come full circle. But probably not. So, um, you think this, Kevin? Do you think this puts more pressure on them to trade Grady Jarrett now? I think it's more likely that they do because, like, does Grady want to sign an extension here now, knowing that it's going to be a rebuild? Um, you know. I don't know. Um, now, with all this newfound cap space next year, they could just tag Jarrett next year if he doesn't want to sign an extension. But it's like, do you want it to go down this ugly path? Like, if you're if you're sort of, like, letting guys out, you know, that, that don't want to be a part of the rebuild, I would just take the pick. Like, if you can get a premium pick for Jarrett. Like, if you get an early second, you know, I would be hoping for a late first, but who knows? Uh, so, like, I would say if you can get an early second for Jarrett, that's probably good enough. Um, and then, you know, I would prefer to keep him. Um, like, if he wants to be here, I would sign him to an extension today uh, and keep him here long term as, like, a key building block. But if he doesn't want to be here and you're going to have to force him to stay with a tag, I mean, I think it's probably better to just get a, get a high pick if you can and go from there. Does Devontae Adams getting tagged and traded, does that – make it feel like a, a better path, an easier path to potentially, you know, just kind of keep Grady Jarrett and, and then see what happens next year as a possibility as, as that, as a possible outcome. It's possible. Um, I certainly think like if they, if they keep, I guess I'm, I would be surprised if Jarrett's not signing an extension and he's still on the roster, but I think that it's a legitimate strategy now with how much cap space they have to go the tag and trade route. Um, so I, I think it's, 
more likely now that that Ryan's not here that Grady leaves the team in the next two seasons than if Ryan was here. But um, I think the most likely scenario is that he gets traded now. And the second most likely is that he signs an extension. And then the third most likely would be that he doesn't sign an extension and then he gets tagged next year and then we'll see what happens. But um, as like a total Grady Jarrett fanboy, you know, I would jealously want him to stay here for all time. But, you know, if he does, if he really doesn't want to be here, it seems like they're sort of letting guys off the hook at this point if they can get the right compensation or not even the right compensation in Matt Ryan's case. So, um, you know, we'll see how that plays out. But it wouldn't shock me if they did if they're more, I mean, I don't think they're more likely to move him now than they were before. Um, cause they're, they shouldn't have any re- like reservations about pretending to compete this year. Like they were last year. So, um, well, they said in that conference, what was it? They still wouldn't say <laughs> we're retooling, rebuild. you know, we're transitioning. Re- uh, retooling. Yeah. yeah. Transitioning. Yeah. Just That's, say the line. Re, it's a re, <laughs> I guess we'll take yep. it. Say the line, Terry. You know, <laughs> I, I'm just thinking, you know, this whole have your cake and eat it too. It's like, you don't necessarily have to trade Grady this year, right? If you right. can tag and trade him, maybe, you know, like yeah. it's like you still keep that door open potentially to do a, an extension. If, you know, for whatever reason, you know, Grady and the team is better and, and Grady's willing to sort of re up and you're willing to use all that cap space. And you still have the option to to trade him next year with a tag and trade option. So I, I think it is worthwhile to not necessarily automatically decide to move Grady Jarrett in the next, you know, couple of weeks or whatever the case may be where the Falcons can kind of, you know, slow play it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think if a team comes offering like a first round pick for Grady, then I think you probably take that. But if the offer is not good enough, then I, I agree. You just sort of hold him and, and see what happens. Um, but you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, DeForest Buckner went for like a mid first. So I feel like Grady could get at least a late first. Uh, I think well, Buckner was younger. But knowing the Falcons, if, if Grady's worth the first, we'll get like maybe a fourth at this rate. <laughs> maybe a fourth, yeah. <laughs> well, it was funny because it's like we thought they got too little for Julio, and then in hindsight, it looks like they actually got by far the better end of that deal. So, like, um, I don't know like where this team stands on compensation for trades now, it's all over the place, but I'm no longer going to assume they're going to get good compensation. So, um, I can only go off of what I would take. And at this point, like if someone came to me with a first round pick for Grady, I would take it. Who knows what Fontenot would take? Maybe he'd also just take a third for Grady, which would be really sad. But, you know, who knows at this point? Anything is possible. Anything is possible. So, um, All right, guys. Well, we've taken up two hours of your time. I've taken up two hours of my illustrious guests' time. Uh, so let's go ahead and wrap up. Uh, please like and subscribe if you guys haven't done so already. Thank you. To, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Falcoholic Live. The next Q&A will be next week. Uh, I'm not exactly sure the date. Probably Monday night, I think we're going to try to do. But I'll keep you guys posted. Check the uh, the Discord and the Patreon for that intel. Um, but before we sign off, officially want to thank my guests. First of all, Aaron Freeman at Falcfans, uh, host of the Locked on Falcons podcast, contributor at thefalconhawk.com. Aaron, anything that you'd like to plug before we sign off? Well, if you're tired of hearing me gripe about Matt Ryan and Terry Fontenot, then you probably don't want to check out uh, tonight's Locked on Falcons on YouTube or tomorrow's Locked on Falcons <laughs> on uh, audio version. But if you you know want to hear me talk about the free agent signings in addition to some of the players that we talked about tonight, you can check out Friday's episode. Uh, of Locked on Falcons, where we do a free agent Friday. So that's on deck. And then next week in Locked on Falcons, we're going to finally start to pivot towards the draft and potentially talk about some of the quarterbacks. So if you're looking forward to moving on from the Matt Ryan chapter, you know, that is coming soon on Locked on Falcons. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Check that out. Quality program over there in addition to ours. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I have enough pride. I have enough, you know, confidence to admit, you know, it's a very quality podcast over there, a very quality program. So definitely check that out as well as this program, you know, don't just check that out. You know, still watch this, but then go there. That That's totally fine. I'll, I'll accept that. Um, you know, what do they say on lockdown? You know, the first listen of the day can be this, but then, you know, the second listen is, is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Also with us today, we have director of guest personnel, Evan Birchfield. Evan, thanks again for getting us another terrific guest in Patrick DeMarco. Uh, anything else you're working on? You'd like to let the people know about? Uh, not really. Just go to the for everything. Um, follow the, 
socials, uh, the Falcoholic on Twitter, Instagram, the underscore Falcoholic on Facebook also. Make sure you like and subscribe to this channel. Yeah, I don't know. I always say this, though, but, like, I don't know how I can talk to Marco, but we'll see what happens. That, yeah, you just keep finding a way. You keep finding a way. But, uh, yeah. yeah. I like getting some of these guys. I mean, they we've been very fortunate because they've all been super cool, you know. I mean, just the last two with Warlow and DeMarco, like, interesting stories and stuff like that. So, yeah, we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah, and as Evan said, go, go, if you do Instagram, go follow the Falcolic Instagram because it's, like, languishing with, like, a thousand followers and we need, like, a, we need 10K mm -hmm. to post links, okay? So if you can, if you do Instagram and you can help out there, go, go like the Instagram Go get that, you know, going. And, and I don't spam yeah. it with memes and no, stuff like that. No. Just give when it's very like, respectable. Yeah. There's news, boom. There you go. So. Yeah. Robert Kelly requests work done, Evan. I'm not going to say I, ha I haven't tried so, <laughs> yeah. multiple times, but mm -hmm. yeah. We're working there's certain on ones it. where, it, yeah, if they don't say anything back, there's nothing I can do. Yeah, so. we, we don't we don't like call them or show up at their houses or anything weird like that. This is this is a respectable program. So yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least if Evan does, he doesn't tell me, which is probably mm -hmm. for the best. I'm like, um, I'm yeah. like, Evan will pay you if you come on. <laughs> yeah, whatever you need. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's best for it's best for all of us if we don't know. So guys, yeah. I'm Kevin Knight at Foul Call Kevin. Like I said, new mock draft coming soon. Uh, scouting reports. I've got several more done that I just need to finalize and put up on the site. So those will be coming uh, soon as well. Obviously we'll have plenty more shows for you guys next week. Uh, I don't, I, you know, I'm not expecting any more breaking news shows, but you know, following the schedule by about Monday, we should probably be doing another breaking news show, you know, maybe when Grady Jarrett gets traded or something. So, you know, who knows <laughs> what's going to happen, but um, maybe the off season will calm down a little bit. Who when knows? when is the draft? I should know this, but late April. I think it's like the last couple the of days. So the it's still yeah. mind boggling. Like we're almost in April already. Yeah, right it's like a month away. You're like a little over a month. Yeah. So you yeah, know, I got to I got to like, really start next, cranking this. Next guy month's before. a draft. Like that's crazy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. We will see you guys again on Wednesday for the next episode of the Falcoholic Live for Evan and for Aaron. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We will talk to you guys next time. Have a great night, folks.